And I'm going to tell you my story about innovation and try to focus on why we innovate today. This is an early project that I made, one of my first pieces of innovation. It's called Musical Jacket, and it's an electronic textile. And it's an electronic textile because it combines electronics and textiles into something new, a jacket that plays music. And you can see there's a little board on there. That's a music synthesizer. And then there's a piece of embroidery with some numbers, and that's a keyboard. And it's made from taking this conductive thread and embroidering it to make a keypad. I'm going to show you a little video of what happens. So you can see by taking two things that are very, very different, electronics and textiles, and putting them together into, into that jacket, you get something new. You get an instrument that you can play, that you can wear on your body. Now, you might wonder why I was making electronic textiles, right? OK? You might say, where did that come from? It wasn't in some kind of vacuum. That was a really collaborative project with lots and lots of people. And I was at this amazing place called the IP Media Lab with lots of smart people. And they had this idea. It was so long ago, in 1997. And they had this idea, what if we put electronics out into the world, into coffee cups and into um, and into parking meters. Could we change the world? And there were some people there called the MIT Wearables Group. And they would strap computers to their body. And they would go around with these boxes and headsets. This was before Google Goggles. This was before email. They had this crazy idea. What if you could read your email all the time without being at your computer, right? And it was really exciting. And they would come to me and say, Maggie, I have this computer. And it's breaking. And it hurts. And I was an artist. And I made things. And I think about their problem, and I thought, well, wouldn't it be great if our computers could be soft so that they didn't have to be hard against our body? And wouldn't it be great if our computers could be beautiful so you didn't have to look like a nerd when you were wearing one? So they were also having a um, fashion show at the time. And I made this dress, which has conductive fabric in two layers. And it has some tulle in between and LEDs in between with conductive Velcro. And when you walk, we're going to show the video here. The, um, the brushes brush against the two layers of conductive fabric, and it completes the circuit, and the dress lights up. So you can see the dress, the little LEDs lighting. And then there's a necklace, and the necklace has multicolored LEDs. Believe it or not, those were new then. No one had multicolored LEDs. And there are conductive tassels that brush against an embroidered power plane. A little current goes to the LEDs, and they change color. This because I was having a lot of fun, and I was working really, really, really hard. I was also doing something else. I was innovating. And innovation is really about bringing together things that aren't, haven't been together before, electronic and tech, te electronics and textiles. And it's also about synthesis. So you take these things that were always separate before, and you bring them together, and you get something new. And you all have a really great example of innovation Probably most of you had it and don't remember that there was a time when we didn't have it, which is your smartphone. It has a camera. It has the internet. It has a GPS. And it also has your phone in one package. Well, before the smartphone, you couldn't send a Twitter message. You couldn't use Facebook to send a picture to your grandmother. And that's an innovation. And what made it innovative was that it was synthesized together to do something it could never do before. So when I left the Media Lab, I wanted to figure out, I had this new thing, electronic textiles, and I knew a lot about it. And I wanted to figure out what I could do to get it out into the world. And I was an artist, so I was making art. And I was also doing contract research for the Army. They were like, well, what if you, could you make camouflage that if you stood in front of a wall, it would change color depending on what the wall was? Or I was working with a fashion company. Could you make a raincoat that would light up when it was going to rain? Or could you make a ski boot that would tell you if you made your turn correctly? And I, like I said, I was making art. I wanted to figure out if these materials had any new artistic possibilities. The first piece I'm going to show you uses the same sensors that we used in the jacket. And the way that those sensors work is that you have a conductive fabric, and you put a charge on it. And when your body touches it, that charge goes to ground through your body because your body's conductive. And then the electronics sense it. 
So this is a piece called and it uses the same sensors, but what I did in this case was I took those sensors and I tufted them into something fuzzy. So I didn't embroider them, I made a different form from them. You can see when you touch this piece, the lights go on and off. And it was made so that you could buy one or two or three or four units and hang them on your wall or put them on your desk. The other piece of art I'm going to show you today is an example of color change textiles that I made. So when I left the lab, I had made music. You saw the musical jacket. And I'd made things that light up. But I wasn't really very happy with how the lights integrated with the fabric. And I wanted something that spoke visually without lights. So I created this kind of fabric that combines traditional electronics. You can see the drive electronics in the center. And they have a little computer chip on them that I program. And then there's some wires that go to the edge of the fabric. And the fabric has very conductive yarn in the top and bottom, and then resistive yarn in the middle. And I know that you girls here at Forest Ridge all know that resistive things heat up when you put current through them, right? So there's a thermochromic ink on the top. And I send current to different parts of the fabric by programming it. And then I can create different patterns and color changes on the surface. So here was a way that a textile could hold hundreds of different patterns. And here's a close up. And you can see here, I use some silver ink to connect the superconductive yarns to the resistive yarns and also to connect it to the wires. And then you can also see some of the stripes are turned on and some of them are off. The ones that are on are light colored, the ones that are dark are off. There's a video. So this is really different than a display. It can't be any color, maybe two colors, bright red or yellow or a dark color, and it's slow. A lot of display, displays are very fast, and you think of them as being able to show a movie. This is really like a painting, where you put paint on a surface, and then you change it under the control of a computer. So while I was making all this art, and also doing research, because I had to pay for all the art, because making electronic art is very expensive. I had this idea that I could also make a product, a design product that I could get out in the world and see what that was about. So I came up with my first idea for my own product at my company. This is the same sensor as the musical jacket. It's the pom-pom dinner. And you just touch the pom-pom, and then the lights go on and off. And it's fun, isn't it? It's a lot of fun. It's really fun first product. Well, and I had a lot of good reasons why I chose this as my first product. It was fun. It was a great example of electronic textile. I could buy this thing off the shelf. I didn't have to make electronics. I could snap it on instead of having to have the, the textile connected to the electronics at a factory. It just snapped on. Um, and and I, I thought that this was going to be a great first project. Well. It was a lot of work. I patented it. I had to get it flame proofed and UL listed. And I spent about five years working on this product to find materials that were correct for the whole product that were flame proof fabric, foam. And then I had to get them all sourced in China because they all had to be super, super, super cheap. And then I redesigned it because I did a market survey and I found out that, well, not many people really wanted to own a pom-pom dimmer. dimmer, dimmer. <laughs> Most people actually wanted something more designy. And then I had to design the marketing materials and figure out how I would reach the stores and figure out who was going to sell my product. And I got it all ready, and I was going to make 50,000 of them in China. And I couldn't do it. Because I figured out that while I was making my little product, and thinking that I was on a path that was the right path, the world had changed. I also had been working on some environmental art projects. I had interns coming to me and saying, I don't think this project is very good for the environment. And all I could see was that I was making a product that should be fun, but that it was going to end up in a landfill, and it was going to contribute to the world's garbage. And what I realized was I was solving the wrong problem. I was doing something that I thought was fun, but the world had changed, and there were other problems to solve. So I want to talk to you guys about why we innovate today. There are a lot of people who would tell you that 
I was wrong for a lot of reasons. It wasn't that I was solving the wrong problem. It's that I didn't use a good design process. I didn't do market research. All the things that people want you to do when you innovate, because what, have, what do they want you to do when you innovate? They want you to create new markets and needs. They want you to make money. That's what they tell you. And I'm here to tell you that innovation is for another reason. The world faces real problems. And I, I don't want to lay these on you girls, but your generation is going to face them more than my generation did. We are in the middle of an environmental crisis, climate change, change as well as pollution. We are going to be facing food shortages, water shortages, incredible economic disparity. Those are real problems that need to be solved. And none of those problems will be solved without innovation. Because all of those problems demand doing two or three things together. You're not going to be a scientist or an economist and solve that, those problems alone. You're going to need to be able to do science and to do design and do some economics. That's what the world needs to solve their problems. And you girls at Forest Ridge, I was so excited to talk to you today because you girls are part of the solution. You girls are going to be some of the best educated people in the history of the world. You probably don't believe me but it's true. <laughs> and I also happen to know that you're some of the hardest working girls in the history of the world. And so when you're here and you're doing your homework and you're like, why do I need to know physics and math and art and all this stuff? Because the problems you will face will demand that you know all of those things. So the thing, the thing I want to leave you with that I learned from my own work, and right now I'm making art in my studio. And I'm also writing about environment, technology, and design. And what I want to leave you with that I learned from my own work is that you can choose what problems to solve in your life. You can make that effort. An earlier speaker said, innovate for good. And a lot of people tell you it doesn't matter. You know, you, anything you work on, something good will come out of. But I don't think the world can really afford that anymore. I think we all need to make the choice, especially from where we're coming from, to work on something for good and to innovate for good. Thank you very much.